we are honored to have with us professor anand prakash sir professor and head department of pediatric hematology oncology and bmt from st john's medical college hospital bangalore uh, we are uh, sir has set up the department of pediatric hemato oncology and bmt at st john's hospital he is actively involved in state national and international pho activities workshops cmes and conferences uh, sir has uh, many research activities and publications in bleeding disorders hemoglobinopathies and pediatric leukemias to his credit we are very honored to have you with us today sir a very warm welcome to you thank you thank you so much anand sir for joining us i think the peripheral smear interpretation is both important clinically for all the pgs and as well for uh, dnb pgs they get do get lot of oski stations on that and case scenario based so this will be a valuable class for them that to when they are expecting practicals in another one month thank you so much for joining us sure uh, thanks so much uh, dr naglata for the kind uh, uh, invitation and uh, to the white army team for the kind introduction uh, like uh, ma'am just mentioned uh, uh, the peripheral smear is an important tool which is accessible to all of us almost anywhere we work and as pediatricians just like a simple chest x ray we are not radiologists but we still need to know how to interpret basics of a chest x ray and let us say some basics of a ct to pick up things quickly and make appropriate diagnosis in the same way the peripheral smear is one blood test which would be accessible with a blood count in almost every place uh, across the world so so that is something which a pediatric postgraduate should know something about so what i thought i'll uh, do in this session is uh, to uh, to go over uh, uh, many simple case scenarios which uh, i'd like you to interact if you can put it, put your answers in the chat box uh, that's great and uh, how to make the best use of a peripheral smear uh, at the end of this class clearly neither you nor me can uh, you know become fully trained pathologist to identify every abnormality on a peripheral smear that's not the intention of this class at all however like i mentioned for any pediatric pg because our job is to make a coherent clinical diagnosis when we do the lab tests which i'm sure we do in a day in and day out we should be able to take a good history do a clinical examination and when we send off the cbc bar ps be able to speak to the pathologist and say this is what i am expecting in the peripheral smear this is what i am thinking of is this what you are seeing so the purpose of this class is to go over some of those scenarios and try and get an organized way of approaching these patients uh, like i said the peripheral smear is just like any other test and its use will be based on how well trained we are uh, often if we try and work backwards that means we don't have a clear history or clinical examination and we are not really sure of what we are thinking of and if we fall back on our cbc and peripheral smear and then work backwards and try and fit in things then we will make errors so one of the purposes of this session is how to use a peripheral smear report and like any other test it has to be interpreted in the context of the patient and the clinical picture which we are thinking of and seeing should fit into the uh, report which you are getting from the uh, peripheral smear and very importantly the uh, clinical picture the cbc the red cell indices and the peripheral smear should correlate so some of the things important to remember is has the child received a recent transfusion have there been any medications given which will affect the cbc red cells and the uh, peripheral smear so some of these things only the clinician will know so unless we co correlate that with the pathologist uh, in this pre previous picture you see these two people with this uh, jigsaw puzzle trying to sort it out so many times clinical diagnosis is jigsaw puzzle and unless the clinician and the pathologist work together just a peripheral smear describing some red cells white cells and platelets is not very helpful so before we go into some of the important pictures and uh, some of the important oski for example exam related oski questions uh, let's look at uh, in a few minutes exactly uh, what should we think of before reading the peripheral smear so first step is 
what is my history and clinical examination telling me what do i expect from my cbc red cells and peripheral smear we should not try and interpret them in isolation so at the end of my history and clinical examination if for example i have anemia i should be able to think is this acute or chronic is this inherited or acquired which pathophysiology does it fall into decreased production increased destruction or blood loss so for when we are reading the hb mcv mch mchc rdw and the peripheral smear red cell part of the ps report we should have at the back of our mind what different disease processes i am thinking of we will come to some examples in the example slides so if i am thinking of an inherited let us say hemolytic anemia already when i send the hb mcv and ps i will speak to my pathologist and say yes i am thinking of thalassemia in this child is this what you are seeing the same way for the white cells remember that the red cells white cells and platelets can change in systemic disease so any infection for example can change the number and the type of white cells just a change in the blood count and peripheral smear does not always mean hematological disease so many systemic diseases infections inflammatory diseases uh, infiltrative diseases benign infiltrative diseases not always malignant any of these things can make changes to the white cell so when we think of uh, you know what is the white cell count what is the differential count and what am i seeing in the peripheral smear am i seeing enough number of cells low or high i will already get an idea okay my systemic presentation for example is a acute infection so yes my cbc is showing this or i thought of this infection but my cbc is showing some different white cell count so am i really thinking correctly so so that correlation should come about then the platelets of course we'll always see whether it's low normal or high so going ahead with the systematic approach in the red cells of course there are different terminologies we'll cover some of that in undergraduation itself we've learned many of these terms the size of the red cell microcytic normocytic and macrocytic the color of the red cell hypochromic normochromic or hyperchromic usually it's hypochromic or normochromic the shape of the red cells very very important in many hematological diseases and uh, looking at the peripheral smear itself can point us to the correct diagnosis in many many inherited hemolytic anemias so so looking at the shape of the red cells is very important so are there any inclusion bodies could these inclusions be because of precipitated iron could these inclusions be because of let's say a parasite like malaria very important in the peripheral smear red cell then we go on to the white cells and look at the relative number based on the age of the child general thumb rule less than 10 year children will have more lymphocytes than neutrophils more than 10 year children should have more neutrophils than lymphocytes simple thumb rule to remember so if i am seeing a change in the relative number of cells too many neutrophils too few neutrophils too many lymphocytes too few lymphocytes this is also part of the peripheral smear interpretation not just looking and saying okay this is a myeloblast so in the cells itself are they mature or immature do they look like a shift to the left many young infants uh, neonates if they are if their marrow is under a stress because of an infection we've all heard of shift to the left where more immature blood cells will be pushed out so sometimes some people like to call it leuco erythroblastic picture so am i seeing lot of immature cells myelocytes metamyelocytes band forms i am not seeing only mature neutrophils then again i will know that okay this pattern of white cell something is wrong okay how do i fit it into my history and examination then the third step is the platelets we talked about the number in the previous slide normal high low we'll also get an idea very importantly about the size of the platelets and the granularity and the morphology of the platelet so that's something very very important in the peripheral smear now suppose the child is clinically well your blood count has shown some 60000 50000 platelet 
you are thinking, okay, I never expected low platelets in this child. It is showing platelets. Looking at the peripheral smear is very helpful because you get a sense of, okay, how many platelets there are on PS. So a small blood clot in the sample can falsely drop the platelet count number. So correlating the history is important. Otherwise, if you just look at the platelet count and say, oh, this child has one day fever, low platelets, I'm thinking of dengue. When it's not really dengue, that doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not a good clinical, this one. So for the clinician, it's very, very important to put everything together. So continuing the systematic approach. So first we said, which are the cells? What is their morphology? Am I looking at abnormal cells or normal cells? I'll look at red cells, white cells and platelets and then start looking at cells I don't expect to see. So we already mentioned inclusions in the red cells. Then some abnormal looking nuclei in the white cells. Any, any cancer cells like blast, lymphoblast, myeloblast. Am I having cells which are normal but are too many, like too many eosinophils? Basophils, you will rarely see. So if you see basophils, you'll think of some little rarer conditions like chronic myeloid, leukemia and things like that. So many of these will give a very good clue to decide what to do further. Then cells normally not in PS, for example, nucleated red blood cells, precursor white cells like blast, these are not supposed to be seen on the peripheral smear. So if I see a lot of nucleated red cells, I'll start thinking, are these primitive nucleated red cells, which are supposed to be in the bone marrow, getting pushed out into the peripheral blood. So if I see that, then I'm immediately going to think of uh, um, some, some peripheral hemolysis and the marrow under strain where young cells are getting pushed out. So now I'm a big fan of cricket, like I'm sure many of you are. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the gentleman on the screen and also his demeanor normally. So before looking at abnormal, we should always look at first what is normal. So before learning what is abnormal CBC, abnormal MCV, abnormal peripheral smear, abnormal X-ray, we should train ourselves to say that, yes, this is normal. So the same way for a peripheral smear, let us first see what is normal so that then anything which looks out of the ordinary, we will say, oh, this is something uh, bizarre, not all right. So this is just a cartoon to show you the different cells. These are obviously the red cells. These other cells with the granules and the large nuclei are the uh, white blood cells. They are named for you here. So the neutrophils would have uh, a lot of uh, uh, segmented uh, the nucleus. The basophils would have a lot of blue coarse granules. The lymphocytes would have no granules. The eosinophils would have base, uh, pinkish eosinophilic granules, which is why it's called eosinophil and very coarse granules. A very large cell with an indented nucleus is a monocyte. So this is just a cartoon going on to the peripheral smear actually. So all of these cells are obviously the red cells. I know some of this is basic, but we'll start with the basics and then go ahead. These are all uh, neutrophils. Follow my cursor. I hope my cursor is seen. And so these are neutrophils. This is also a neutrophil. This is also neutrophil. You'll see that they have segmentation of their nucleus. And these specks, which you see here, multiple specks, like almost uh, pieces of dust fallen on the slide, are the platelets. So when you see a peripheral smear, any pathologist will tell you that looking at the overall pattern is very important. Uh, at, at the wrong place in the slide, remember that when you put a drop of blood on a slide and spread it out, it will have one area with a lot of blood, which is called the head, one area in the center, which is called the body, and one area which has very thin blood, which is called the tail. So the peripheral smear has to be read in low power, uh, medium power, and in oil immersion, high power, at just the junction between the body and the tail. How do you know you are in the right place to read the peripheral smear? The red cells should be just touching each other or not touching each other. So if you find a lot of overlapping red cells, you are not reading the slide in the correct place. So you will get a lot of um, morphological variations which are artifacts. So in any peripheral smear, I can guarantee you that you will see spherocytes. 
So if you look at the wrong area of the spherical smear, you will diagnose it as hereditary spherocytosis. So in your OSCE, I hope the people helping you out will, uh, you know, put this slide in the correct place for you. But if you have to actually focus this slide, look for the area where the red cells are just touching each other. They should not be very, very widely spaced also. They should be just like this, what is there on your screen. So when you look at this, this is the usual pattern. So what are the few things that we are seeing here? We are seeing the red cells, which have all a central pallor. Most of the red cells have a central pallor. Don't look at one or two cells like this and say, look, this is looking, this is different, this is looking different. Remember that red cells are like human beings. Some will be, you know, good looking, some will be little not so good looking, but they're all nice people. So don't try and say that one or two cells are looking like this. So this is, you know, some big disease. That is not correct. There will be some degenerated red cells like this. So that is not the diagnosis. So overall pattern has to be seen. So when we see the overall pattern, we see this central pallor and the central pallor has to be around one third of the whole RBC. If it is more than one third, we start thinking of abnormal hemoglobinization of the red cell. In the white cells, in a child who is older, we all older than 10 years, we always expect more neutrophils. So even in an infection, you'll get lots of neutrophils. In a child with, let's say, pertussis, you'll get lots of lymphocytes. So a, a good pathologist will just look at this quickly and say, oh, somehow the neutrophils are more, somehow the lymphocytes are more. So they'll get the pattern. Then uh, these are the platelets. So like I mentioned in the example, Whenever you have a child with low platelet count, quickly ask your pathologist in the peripheral smear also, are you seeing a low platelet count? So a child, this child seems to have a normal number. Lots of platelets are seen. So a child with, let's say, dengue will have a few platelets here and there, 5,000, 10,000 platelet count. So in the peripheral smear itself, you'll get a general idea as to what the platelet count is. Now, this is another cartoon just to guide us through before we go to the actual cases. So these are the red cells, of course. Uh, let's do one by one. So this is uh, a lymphocyte with a uniform nucleus and a blue cytoplasm. This is a neutrophil. These coarse granules here, which are pinkish, are eosinophils. These coarse granules, which are bluish, are basophils. So these are all, um, that's why it's called granulocytes. The neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils are all called granulocytes, right? And the mononuclear cells are the lymphocytes and the monocytes because they're supposed to have one nucleus like most other cells. So a large cell with a lot of cytoplasm will be a monocyte. So if you get a lot of monocytosis, you're thinking of infections. It could be viral, it could be tuberculosis, right? And sometimes rare diseases like juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia and all that, not important, uh, rare. But when you have a lot of monocytosis, that is what to think of. Then lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, of course, in children, many, many children will have a lymphocytic predominance less than six, less than eight years of age. So when you see a lot of lymphocytes, that doesn't make it abnormal. And a lot of viral infections can cause a lot of young lymphocytes. So young lymphocytes are some called, sometimes called atypical lymphocytes. So what is atypical about them? They look a little big. They look a little immature. So in this nucleus, you're not seeing any nucleoli, small circles within the nucleus. So if you see those, then you'll start thinking, is this a blast? So that's why atypical cells versus blast is sometimes a little tricky. And we have to, if we are thinking of leukemia and the pathologist says query atypical cells, then, you know, you really have to go ahead and say, okay, should I do a bone marrow test and things like that. Whereas if I'm thinking this child has fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, you know, rash and a coated tongue, I'm definitely thinking of, let's say, infectious mononucleosis. I get a lot of lymphocytes. Some are looking little immature. I don't have to worry the family and say that, yes, probably we're thinking of uh, leukemia. So clinical picture is very, very important. So this is a platelet, a small speck of cell. Okay, right. So uh, again, a few basic rules. The size of the RBCs, this is often asked in exams. So this is a small lymphocyte and this is the RBC. So if we have RBCs smaller than the small lymphocyte, it's called a microcyte. If we have RBCs larger than the small lymphocyte, it's called a macrocyte. Basic rules we learned in MBBS. So uh, microcytic red cells, this is a small lymphocyte. 
this is a, a young uh, neutrophil. So these are all red cells. And so microcytic cells will be smaller than the small lymphocyte. And you'll notice that this cell has a greater area of central pallor. It is more than the usual one third. So we know that this cell is small and there's also less hemoglobinization of the red cell, right? So that is what is a microcytic cell. Okay, so now I think uh, we'll start interacting with the participants. Uh, right, I'll keep the chat window open on one side and uh, do feel free to, you know, type in your answers and uh, I mean, you are allowed to shout out answers. Uh, you are free to type in also and then we can uh, go ahead. So uh, I'll give you the case scenario. Remember, we are all clinicians. Uh, we should think as to what do I expect in my blood count and peripheral smear. There's some more information you want. Please uh, let me know. I'll tell you the information for the patient and then you can try and solve the peripheral smears. So this is a first case is a two-year-old who has come in for a regular uh, you know, check to the pediatric outpatient for a fever, cold cough. Baby is otherwise looking well. You find that the baby is quite pale. So, so you don't just write cross in and you know saline drops and send the baby away. You're a good uh, pediatric PG or consultant. So you check and find that the baby is quite pale and you find that uh, you do a quick hemoglobin and you find that it is six grams. And this is your peripheral smear. So would anyone like to? Okay, so I think Vaishnavi has said anisopoiclocytosis. Okay, good. So I think somebody was listening to the first part. Definitely Dr. Swati was listening because she wants to know more history. Well done. So yes, so this is a two-year-old child who's only on cow's milk. This family is giving only cow's milk. He doesn't eat anything else, not hungry to eat anything else. So very importantly, the history will give you a clue as to what to look for in the peripheral smear. So Dr. Shalini says microhypo and uh, the diagnosis of iron deficiency. So I think uh, mo most of you did get this. It's a straightforward microcytic hypochromic, very common in our country, very important to pick up clinically. Many times you don't even need a hemoglobin in a peripheral smear. Uh, but if the child is looking sick or you know child is very pale, you want a baseline so that when you treat, you can follow up the child and make sure that the child gets proper treatment. It's good to do a baseline hemoglobin uh, differential count and a uh, peripheral smear, quite uh, less expensive. So if this is the small lymphocyte, this is a small RBC. And look at the general pattern. All over, most of the RBCs are smaller than this small lymphocyte. Okay. Some of the other uh, telltale signs are, look at this cell. This is called a pencil cell, right? And why did uh, Dr. Shalini say micro? We understood. Why did she say hypo? Because like I showed in the previous uh, slide, uh, the, the, uh, there's a thin rim of normal hemoglobin in the periphery. So the, there is increase in the one third of uh, uh, central pallor. So this is a child with severe, probably severe iron deficiency anemia and uh, you would treat appropriately, right? If this child came back, uh, you know, uh, without uh, improvement after a month of oral iron therapy, what all would you do? I'm sorry, I'm a clinician. I can't stick only to peripheral smear. So you can quickly type in your answers. After one month, no improvement. What are all the DDs? Okay, somebody wants to do iron studies. Uh, hey, I presume that's electrophoresis, sickle cells. Okay, a lot of answers coming in. Electrophoresis, right. Okay, good. So, so, uh, so we will come to some of those answers. We'll tackle this patient now. Many of you are thinking along the right lines and we'll move to the second case. This is an eight-month-old uh, baby who comes with progressive pallor. On clinical examination, has a three-centimeter liver and a five-centimeter spleen. Now, remember that whenever you look at spleen and liver size, the size of the baby is very important, right? So, so you have to measure and know is this small, medium or large? Uh, that is very important. So in this eight-month-old baby, this baby seems to have a relatively big liver and spleen. And the hemoglobin is four grams, right? And this is the peripheral smear. 
So what are you seeing? What is your differentiation? So there are uh, this this uh, blood film looks very different from uh, this one. Somebody has said macrocytic. Somebody has seen target cells. Okay. Yes, there may be one target cell here. I agree with you. Definitely one target cell here. Okay. Uh, so, right. So, in this child, it's very different from the previous child. This is an eight-month-old who has heptospinomegaly and has come to you with severe anemia. And when you look at this peripheral smear, what do you notice in the red blood cells? They look really messy. So, Sometimes the pathologists call this a dirty picture. So why do they call it a dirty picture? Because the red blood cells are not just small. They are definitely small. They are not just small. They are not just poorly hemoglobinized. Somebody had mentioned anisopoikilocytosis. That means change in the shape and the size. So if in iron deficiency, you do have mild anisopoikilocytosis, which means change in shape and size of the red blood cells. In thalassemia major, I think the white army, whoever is managing the white army has got the answer. DD, thalassemia major. So, um, this is thalassemia major with severe anisopoikilocytosis. So, if you see a, a picture of all broken down RBCs, significant microcytosis, severe change in shape and size of the RBCs, then you are thinking of uh, thalassemia major. Now look at some of these cells. They look almost like a small lymphocyte. Look, there are so many of these. So could these be lymphocytes? Yes, they could be lymphocytes. They could also be, what could they also be? I think you're all doing well in the answers. So we'll ask some tough questions. What could they also be? There's so many of these cells. Okay, somebody says they are blasts. But since we have, you know, said that this is not a, uh, a leukemia, yes, sometimes those cells could look like blasts. You're close to the answer. I think one Dr. Uma. Okay, very good. Vaishnavi is doing well. And uh, I think Danish also has got the answer. Nucleated RBCs. You're absolutely right. Because this child is having a thalassemia, a lot of premature, immature RBCs, the marrow is under stress. It's trying to make hemoglobin. So, a lot of the RBCs are getting pushed out. So they are nucleated RBCs. So well done. So many times you will see some of these cells called target cells, which have a central uh, uh, central uh, uh, hyper uh, uh, pigmented area, which looks like a target. Remember that this is not pathognomonic of thalassemia. You could get target cells in various conditions. You can get it in iron deficiency anemia. You can get it in liver disease. So it is not pathognomonic of a hemoglobinopathy. Yes, in thalassemia, you do see it, but the general severe anisopoikilocytosis is what gives you the clue. So well done. I think people did well on that. So identify this cell. This becomes quite easy now. What There's a nice arrow there in the center to point you to the cell. Okay, somebody said lymphocyte. Okay. It does look like a lymphocyte, but what is a little different is that the, the cytoplasm is a little more bluish than the usual lymphocyte. So this is, and the nucleus is not as, uh, as yeah, more bluish, that's right. It's, um, it's not as condensed as a lymphocyte. So what do we mean by condensed? Tightly packed. So when you see a cell like this, this is a typical nucleated RBC. So when you see nucleated RBCs, what are the differential diagnosis? When do you get nucleated RBCs? Come, come. Everyone's doing well. You'll need to be very quick and type in quickly. No negative marks. When do you get a lot of nucleated RBCs in the peripheral blood? Correct. So more marrow production shift to the left. 
So whenever the marrow is under stress, whenever you're getting a lot of peripheral red cell destruction, you get primitive RBCs being pushed into the peripheral blood. So classic example is thalassemia. Many uh, newborns who are born with birth asphyxia would have some few nucleated RBCs. Let us say you have a child with osteopetrosis, infant with gotchas, fibrosis in the marrow. These are all situations in which nucleated RBCs will be pushed out. Any for you and for me, simple differential diagnosis, any hemolytic anemia. Well done. I think Durgeshwari said hemolytic anemia, hemolysis with compensation, Arpita is saying. So that's right. Any hemolytic anemia, if it is severe, can have nucleated RBCs. Okay. So this, we'll go on to the next, uh, next uh, patient. So this is a three-year-old boy, intermittent pallor and jaundice since birth. Episodic pallor and jaundice since birth. His spleen is five centimeters. Okay. And uh, this is his peripheral smear. Again, this is a child with pallor and jaundice, right? So you're either thinking of liver disease or you're thinking of hemolytic anemia. So somebody said hemolytic anemia, somebody said sickle and G6PD, you need to be a little more precise. These are all reasonable differential diagnosis from the history and the examination. But these are not after you've seen the peripheral smear. Right, so those who said G6PD and um, sickle and all that, okay, from history you can think of. Okay, so many are now saying spherocytosis. Some are putting question mark after it also. Yes, it is spherocytosis. So what is the history? History is intermittent pallor and jaundice. And so nobody asked me the history. If you'd asked me the history, I would have said unconjugated jaundice. So then hemolytic anemia. And then which type of hemolytic anemia? Congenital or acquired? This looks like congenital hemolytic anemia because this is present since birth. So I am thinking of an intermittent hemolysis, congenital hemolytic anemia with unconjugated hyperbilly. Child is otherwise well. Spleen is big. Nobody asked me family history. Okay. So when you look at this peripheral smear, you will find that this is the lymphocyte. Look at all these red blood cells. They have lost their central pallor. So they are spherocytes. So just seeing a few spherocytes in the peripheral smear does not make it hereditary spherocytosis. The pattern should be there. So sometimes pathologists like to say at least 30% of the cells should be spherocytes. So if your history and clinical examination is fitting in based on the severity of the spherocytosis, remember that spherocytosis could be mild, moderate or severe based on the different mutations the child has. So if the child has a severe spherocytosis, the child will have more episodes of pallor and jaundice, the spleen will be bigger and the peripheral smear will show a lot of spherocytes. Whereas if the child has mild pallor, some mild ictris, never transfused, but always little big spleen, HB is little borderline, retic is high, then you may have few spherocytes. So looking carefully, making sure that you pick up these spherocytes is important. So you're right. Well done. This is hereditary spherocytosis, right? So identify this cell. What is this cell? These are all normal RBCs. What is this? It's an RBC with a color change. So the color or the chrome of the RBC has changed. It is looking a little bluish and a little pinkish. Do you agree with me? It is looking poly, absolutely. It is looking direct, I mean, it is polychromatic. Uh, so, so some of you have said methemoglobin. Methemoglobin cannot be diagnosed by peripheral smear. But those who have said polychromatophilic RBC, that's correct. Methemoglobin, even the blood itself will look brownish. Right? In polychromatophilic RBC, that those young RBCs which still have the RNA material, they are not as young as the nucleated RBCs, but they have not lost their like reticulocytes. So they look a little pinkish, a little bluish, but they're not as pink as a mature RBC. So it is polychromatophilic red cell. So if your peripheral smear shows polychromasia, or polychromatophilic red cell seen. You can be sure that recently this child has had some hemolytic episode for whatever reason. Okay. 
so so well done for those who said uh, polychromasia okay next uh, child five year old girl coming from mm hills mm hills is famous for whom quickly type in the answer while the uh, academic people can look at the peripheral smear those who are not so academic can type in who was the famous person from mm hills okay very academic people already telling the um, peripheral smear answer all right good okay nobody is into general knowledge everyone is only into hematology that's wonderful okay so from mm hills fever fast breathing and all that so what is this why is everybody coming on one diagnosis this is an easy diagnosis this is where the peripheral smear will give you the diagnosis you don't need any other blood test strictly speaking but to quantify the sickle cells those who said sickle is right to quantify the sickle cells this is one this is one i mean it's very obvious here to quantify the sickle cells you do need the hplc or hp electrophoresis right what is this this is a nucleated red blood cell what is this this is a polychromatophilic red blood cell are there target cells yes there are target cells right so so target cells like i said are not very specific and what is this x ray showing it is showing a wedge shape for the want of time i'll quickly go ahead it's showing a wedge shaped opacity so remember that you can have true chest infections in a child with sickle cell so how to treat sickle chest is a common pg question so you have to give ceftriaxone for um, capsulated organisms you have to give azithromycin for atypical organisms plus you have to hydrate the patient give oxygen give pain control remember if you get these type of wedge shaped deposits in the lung it could be an infarct in the lung because of acute chest syndrome so in a sickle cell patient if you get an x ray like this you would say that yes this patient is hypoxic this patient has sickle cells so i'm thinking of acute chest syndrome so hydration oxygenation uh, giving appropriate antibiotics very important okay so well done for all those nobody said who comes from mm hills you can google that later okay 3 year old boy acute onset of pallor and dark urine so this is the urine which the uh, postgraduate very uh, you know uh, astutely collected this condition if you look at the urine you should be able to think of the differential diagnosis hb is 7.8 i have given you two peripheral smears here just so that you know you get a picture uh, again methemoglobin dr danish will change the blood color it will not change the urine color okay somebody is saying p and h that's not a bad answer hemoglobinuria can cause uh, peroxone and octane hemoglobinuria can cause a change in the urine color like this but i am a simple doctor i think of common diagnosis so yes somebody has said white cell so this is a white cell this is what is called a blister cell so when you have an acute this is also a blister cell okay this is another bite cell a bite cell right so when you have an acute onset of intravascular hemolysis acute onset of intravascular hemolysis changing the urine color the first thing to think of is g6pd or malaria so peripheral smear becomes very very important in this child past history becomes very very important has the child taken any drugs becomes very very important and in this peripheral smear with this urine if you are there most likely this is g6pd so what happens the uh, oxidative stress will precipitate the hemoglobin in the red blood cell and the precipitated hemoglobin will come to one edge of the red blood cell so then you have a you have the a, a blister cell if your precipitated hemoglobin is bitten off by the spleen so you have part of the red blood cell bitten off by the spleen that is called a bite cell so whenever you have a child with intravascular hemolysis ask your pathologist are you sir or madam seeing bite cells and blister cells right this is again a polychromatophil slightly pinkish slightly bluish compare it with the rest of the cells this is looking a little bigger which means it's more primitive and it's also looking a little bluish pink which means that it is not as mature as the rest of the cells right so well done to all of those this is a very good group dr naglata i don't think they need me but just for revision okay so a 14 year old girl pallor for 3 months mild ictris no organomegaly hb is 
total count is slightly borderline mild leukopenia platelets are also borderline low okay so this is a little bit of a giveaway what are you seeing in the red cells so okay some people are saying meg okay somebody just said mega right okay so megaloblastic somebody said hypersegmented neutrophil that's correct any neutrophil with more than 6 lobes or 5 neutrophils with 5 lobes or more is called a hypersegmented neutrophilic picture when we see the um, rbcs of course i have not shown a small lymphocyte here but these are macrocytic red cells so if you have oval macrocytes then with hypersegmented neutrophils then you will think of a folate plus minus b12 deficiency it could be any when you use the term some people said megaloblastic remember that megaloblastic is a term used for the bone marrow in the peripheral smear you will say macrocytic blood picture with hypersegmented neutrophil so i am thinking of b12 plus minus folate deficiency so adolescent children in our country many children i'm sure during your training you would have seen will come with you know nutritional anemia okay uh okay why no organomegaly okay good question dr avinash i specifically mentioned no organomegaly here because whenever we have a pancytopenia somebody somebody dr vaishnavi said pancytopenia that's absolutely right two or more cell lines being affected is pancytopenia then immediately we say okay should i do a marrow or should i not do a marrow so if you have a child with you know pallor three months some pancytopenia and you have organomegaly i will be worried to call this a pure nutritional anemia whereas if i have a pancytopenia no organomegaly either my diagnosis is a b12 folate nutritional problem or aplastic anemia right correct so aplastic could also be no organomegaly with pancytopenia but what is little against aplastic anemia dr avinash and others why do you think this is not really aplastic of course aplastic will not have a hypersegmented neutrophil what in the cbc tells you that this is not a typical aplastic anemia there is pancytopenia yeah dr avinash you can unmute and talk i don't mind if i can hear you i will answer correct so the normal neutrophil count that's right so in aplastic well done so in uh, swati and i think avinash got that so uh yeah in this differential count the neutrophils are predominant so we are quite happy with the overall marrow function uh if this was a true severe aplastic anemia the neutrophils would have been let's say 5 10 20% 20%, and the lymphocytes would have been more so so you would have an absolute neutrophil count which is very very low so so this picture is more like a nutritional and once you treat the child remember that in any nutritional anemia the iron deficiency child you saw first or this b12 deficiency plus minus folate deficiency right very very important to after giving the nutrient follow up the child follow up the cbc and check is this child getting better or no because there could be variations and you can't of course this is a very classical case of b12 deficiency many children with pancytopenia will look like b12 deficiency if you do a b12 the level will be low because many children in our country are nutritionally b12 deficient but their pancytopenia could be leukemia their pancytopenia could be uh, aplastic anemia so following up the child after hematinics is very very important okay we'll go ahead okay so this is a 4 year old uh, boy i think with fever for 3 weeks he has some pallor and bruising he has generalized lymphadenopathy i made it very simple hb is 6 total count is 85000 and platelet count is 22000 so you are seeing the low par and the high par okay so i think dr nasla says uh, infectious mononucleosis yes possible okay somebody says leukemoid reaction yes possible 
Vaishnavi says abnormal blasts. Yes, possible. Somebody wants to be more specific and directly say acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Okay, possible. Okay, so I think quite a few have, have thought along the right lines. So whenever you get, right, so whenever you get uh, a, a child with an, an abnormal blood count, fall back on your history. In this particular child, infectious mononucleosis is still possible, but by third to fourth week, I would expect the child to start getting better. So if my previous counts have been okay and this child's white cell count is steadily going up, hemoglobin platelets are steadily coming down, child is not looking good, continues to have fever, then uh, you will think of a more sinister process than infectious mono. So I think Dr. Avinash has asked, will infectious mono have generalized or cervical? It could have either the the uh, the Epstein Barr virus could cause a generalized lymphadenopathy, so that alone will not help you to differentiate whether this is Epstein Barr or a true leukemia. So, what will actually help you? A good pathologist will help you. I'm not joking here. A good pathologist and your clinical sense as to following up the child. So, suppose this child you follow up in a week's time and you know the child is not getting better then this is clearly not uh, infectious mono and in your different total count if your total count is 85000 one none of you all said i want the differential count if your differential count shows 80% blasts right then you are not going to wait for a week and say oh maybe this is ebv i'll call the child back after a week after a week, the child will be very sick. The count would have gone to 2 lakhs, 2.5 lakhs. And the child is very sick and you might get into trouble for missing an acute leukemia. So whenever you have two or more cell lines, here HB is low, platelets are quite low, very important to get a good peripheral smear. right? Now, whenever you look at the peripheral smear, if there are a lot of these large white cells, look at this cell, it's quite large right? Look at this cell, right? This cell is looking a little different from this cell. All of these cells have, the nucleus is very large compared to the cytoplasm. The nucleus is quite tightly packed. So, so these atypical looking cells are what we call blasts, right? So, so many times it's quite tricky for the pathologist to differentiate a atypical lymphocyte from a blast. So in that situation, if you are worried, the next step is to repeat serial counts. And if the child comes like this to you, probably do a marrow because the marrow will give you a better picture and the marrow is sent for flow cytometry. The flow cytometry will correlate and tell us my cell looks like a blast is my cell also having markers which fit into a blast? So what is flow cytometry? It tells us where are these cells coming from and how primitive are the cells. So I, I might, it might look like a blast. It might be confusing, but the flow cytometry will definitely tell us, yes, these are very primitive cells. They are a clone of cells. They have B cell origin. So the markers will tell you clearly that, yes, this is fitting into a blast population. So doing a marrow Flow cytometry in a center which looks after children with cancer routinely is the way to go ahead for this check. So if you compare, now let's do this case and then compare the two cases. Now look at this five-year-old child with fever for three weeks, severe mucosal bleeding, again low HB, not very high total count, but platelet count is very low. So that might explain the bleeding. What are you seeing here? You're all doing well. It's been a long session. I'm almost about to. Okay, excellent. Well done. So I think uh, Arpita, Vaishnavi, many people have got Avinash, Myeloplast. Okay, somebody wants to even go and say M3. All right. Okay, not bad. Right. Uh, good. So so uh, AML, yeah. I think it's at, 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 at a basic level, I think it's reasonable to say 
these are looking like blasts because the cells look completely uh, i mean abnormal they are very large cells uh, we'll do this one first they are very large cells the nucleus is quite big it's taking up quite a lot of space but there is place for cytoplasm okay if you look at this side on the right side these are the or rods which some of your colleagues picked up okay so so these are definitely myeloid blasts okay if you compare these blasts let's go back to the previous slide if you compare these blasts with these blasts the myeloid blasts are always bigger the myeloid blasts will have grand uh, will have more granularity they may have or rods the lymphoblast will have a more tight tightly packed cytoplasm and the um, cyto will have a more tightly packed nucleus and the cytoplasm will be a just a thin rim okay so a thin rim of cytoplasm is a lymphoblast whereas quite a lot of cytoplasm seen quite a lot of cytoplasm seen look at all these cells quite a bit of cytoplasm is seen but the whole cell looks abnormal clusters of cells all sticking together and having a discussion are blasts right and if you look at this nucleus versus the previous nucleus this is like a sieve so a sieve like thin chromatin is a myeloblast whereas a compact tightly packed chromatin is a lymphoblast many of the myeloblasts will have can you look at these small holes within the nucleus so these are all this one this one this one this one i hope you are all seeing my uh, pointer so these are all nucleoli so if you have lot of nucleoli within the myelo within the blast it is more likely to be a myeloblast so i think we have about 8 minutes left okay uh, so this 3 year old is come with fever bloody diarrhea facial puffiness hb is 6 grams total count is 5600 platelets are low you are hardly seeing any platelets and creatinine is on the higher side okay so the history i think was a giveaway what are you seeing on the peripheral smear correct good good well done well done so what we are seeing here look at these arrows they are all pointing i mean i made it easy for everyone all the arrows are pointing in the right place so when you have these type of cells so so many of you got it right well done all pediatric pg should be able to pick up children with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia what is few differential diagnosis of severe microangiopathic hemolytic anemia simple sepsis sepsis can come with fragmented red blood cells right can come with histocytes but what are we worried about not only sepsis and dic we are also worried about microangiopathic hemolysis in the setting of hus if there is a renal dysfunction so so if a child comes in unwell has an elevated creatinine and peripheral smear shows you know uh, uh, low hb low platelets look ask your pathologist to look for histocytes because if you find histocytes then you would have made your diagnosis otherwise a sick child who comes in like this anyone will just say sepsis sepsis induced aki you know so unless you make the clear diagnosis you can't institute therapy so why is the why do the cells become fragmented like this so whenever you have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia what is happening within the kidney is there's lots of abnormal fibrin strands which are falling so if you can see my hand like this so lots of fibrin strands which block up the glomeruli so if you have red cells moving through these fibrin strands they get cut off so that fragment is what is seen as so one part of it so this is one part of the rbc this is also one part of the rbc this is a fragment of the rbc right so helmet cells white cells so these are all different terminology histocyte these are all different terminologies used for any child with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia common cause of microangiopathic hemolysis is hus hus can be d plus or d minus so that the nephrologist will teach you so again look here you can see two rbcs which are looking a little more bluish why because there is hemolysis going on so young rbcs are getting pushed up okay this is a normal white blood cell neutrophil okay 8 10 uh, 
okay got it got it we'll we'll just close up now uh, renal insufficiency okay right so we're almost towards the end yeah so quickly this child 12 year old with the acute onset pallor tipped spleen 4 gram hemoglobin and i'm not able to cross match the uh, rbcs i want to give transfusion and this is the peripheral smear acute onset pallor good so danish says autoimmune hemolytic anemia that's absolutely right so if you have a child with acute onset of pallor and you are not able to cross match blood quickly send a direct coombs test these are all agglutinated red cells why are they agglutinating because they have antibody sitting on them so it could be warm cold peroxinal cold maybe in the next session sometime we can tackle that spot diagnosis spot diagnosis inclusion within the red cells malaria very good so those who don't know malaria please go back to the atlas and look at it very very important both from exam and live practical spot diagnosis what are these cells they look almost the size of a red blood cell but they are very thin very papery child has come with frequent epistaxis child has come with platelets of 75000 okay very good somebody has said mega platelets well done uh, these are not gotcher cells gotcher cells are usually seen in the marrow mega karyocytes also good thought dr shalini but those are seen in the marrow you won't see mega karyocytes in the peripheral blood so the correct answer is large platelets so if i have a child with large platelets frequent epistaxis and 75000 platelet what is the diagnosis yes it could be itp yes that's possible i was thinking more of uh, bernard solier was will have uh, with scott aldrich dr vaishnavi will have small platelets not large platelets you will have very tiny platelets okay that was large platelets a platelet is supposed to be a speck you know compared to the red cell it's supposed to be very small this is almost the size of a red cell so this is a very large platelet so in fact in itp also you will have few large platelets you won't have all of these large platelets. uniform large platelets means bernard solier but itp is reasonable large platelets do occur in itp okay right so this is a child with uh, are we are we out of time i think we are just at about 8 o'clock can i just finish up in one one or two minutes yes sir yes sir definitely Sure. So, three-year-old with frequent fever, pancytopenia, and a large spleen. So, this is the Kit Kat question. So, so those of you who put the answer and send me your address or something, we'll offer you fellowship at Saint John's or SR ship at least, and uh, we'll send you a Kit Kat by post. Okay. Somebody said toxic granules. Okay, reasonable answer. Good. toxic granules sometimes can look like this not a bad answer okay heinz bodies will occur again a good thought but heinz bodies will occur its precipitation of within the red cells not within the white cell remember that there is a big nucleus here so this is originally a white cell this is the granularity of a white cell in chediac higashi okay so this is a child who is having hlh with recurrent fever cytopenia and a large spleen hlh chediac higashi in chediac higashi you will get granularity in the white cells okay right so 6 year old short stature 5 grams hemoglobin tlc normal platelet normal last one minute so what is this showing see i have given the answer also normocytic normochromic anemia what will you do next okay dr durgeshwari is saying kalas are from somewhere okay not for this probably for the previous one okay yes if you have a cell with uh, granules you can think of kalas are but that's usually in the marrow you won't see it in the peripheral blood okay right so coming back to this child so why i put up this is that this is a normal peripheral smear excellent dr shalini should get a round of applause she is asking for renal function test 
this is a child with chronic kidney disease so the peripheral smear will just have normocytic normochromic anemia the peripheral smear will otherwise be completely normal so good arpita says anemia of chronic disease definitely possible so my last slide remember that many diseases will have a non diagnostic peripheral smear we saw a lot of diagnosis today but you should remember non diagnostic for example systemic diseases ckd rheumatological diseases with chronic inflammation if a child has a primary bleeding disease they'll just come with anemia ps will be normal right a child with pancytopenia with aplastic anemia peripheral smear can be normal a child with leukemia till the blood blast come to the peripheral blood a child with leukemia will have pancytopenia peripheral smear may not have blast so pancytopenia not resolving do a marrow storage disorders you can't diagnose only with a peripheral smear you need enzyme analysis erythroblastic blood picture is one other differential for uh, it doesn't say which is the diagnostic it just tells you that the marrow is under stress okay pure red cell aplasia yes the uh, dr avinash is asking about pure red cell aplasia and pure red cell aplasia you will have just a mildly macrocytic anemia with white cells platelets being normal so you can't diagnose pure red cell aplasia on the peripheral smear you will have to do further evaluation do a marrow show that Uh, erythroid precursors are not maturing uh, so that is the thing so just the last uh, 10 seconds on take home points always remember that you and i are pediatricians we are not pathologists so our job is to get the full history clinical examination and go with a list of differential diagnosis to the pathologist look at the red cell indices don't just agree with the pathologist when they say micro hypo picture micro hypo picture ask them this mcv is showing like this but you are saying micro hypo why okay check whether there's been a recent transfusion treatment given can alter the peripheral smear if the child has got a transfusion then you may get transfused red blood cell so important to tell the pathologist that a transfusion has been given have a systematic approach check is this a normal or an abnormal peripheral smear if it is abnormal then look at all red cells white cells platelets size shape normals versus abnormals inclusion and always remember that many diseases you can diagnose with a good peripheral smear sickle spherocytosis thal g6pd we saw quite a few leukemias so quite a few examples some are non diagnostic ps so you should know when to say that just because my ps is normal doesn't mean that the child does not have a hematological disease does not mean my child does not have a systemic disease okay so i think i'll end here thank you so much for the